Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Making a Scientist. If you're anything like me, then you've downloaded this podcast because you're a curious, burgeoning scientist and you're just starting to figure out your journey. The following is a conversation that took place between myself, Alex Ainsco, and Dr. Tom McKinnon during the UK's latest lockdown in January 2021. Any views or opinions that are expressed in this podcast are those of the individual and they do not represent the institutions in which they work. Please leave this podcast a review, follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more. This podcast is by young scientists for young scientists. So we want to hear from you. Please be sure to get in touch. Today's guest is Dr. Tom McKinnon from the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College London. Tom is a senior lecturer in immunology and inflammation and runs a successful thrombosis and hemostasis lab. He's the co-director for the Molecular Medicine Master's course at Imperial College, and he's got many publications and honors to his name. I'm extremely grateful that he's found the time to speak to me today to share his advice and opinions on his experience and in his time in science. So without further ado, let's begin. Dr. Tom McKinnon, thank you very much for being the first guest ever on our podcast, How to Make a Scientist. I'd like to start by asking you if you wouldn't mind explaining to the listeners about the area of research that you work in. Hi, sure, Alex. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to be your your first person to interview as your podcast series. Um, Okay, so I work in the field of thrombosis and hemostasis. Um, So essentially, I look at how blood clots. So my lab look at the... um, looks at the mechanisms behind our, our blood clots. We look at it from the clinical uh, point of view and also from the you know basic science point point of view as well. So so what more is there to be done with blood clotting? We've got drugs like heparin, which uh, which dissolve clot, and um, I suppose what is the ultimate aim behind yeah, it? Yeah, a uh, good question. So I think at the moment there are lots of drugs that are around. There's there's lots of drugs which can prevent fatal blood clots, and on the other side there's there's lots of weird and wonderful therapies that can uh, now help help people who who bleed too much. But there's still so much we really don't un- understand. Uh, there's still many mechanisms that we don't understand. There's interactions between the hemostatic system and the immune system, which are now coming to light, which which we really just have very, you know, kind of like sort of limited knowledge about and, and really needs further research. And also a lot of uh, some of the um, anti-thrombotic drugs that are used, is, they are very, very effective. OK, they're, you know, wonderful drugs. They 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 save lives. Um, but there are still bleeding side effects, um, you know, associated with them. So there is still plenty more research to be done and plenty more scope to design new and much safer drugs. So I noticed one of the, uh, the main uh, focuses of your lab is to work on a protein called von Willebrand factor. So I just wondered if you could explain to the listeners what one von Willebrand factor is, uh, maybe a little bit about where it comes from. Yeah, sure, of course. So von Willebrand factor is it's a large multimeric plasma glycoprotein. That's a sentence that I've said many times throughout my uh, research life. But it's, it's, it's basically a big sticky ball of string. So it circulates in your uh, blood vessels. And essentially what it does is that when you, you injure yourself, you've got your, your damaged blood vessel. Um, your, the, the first thing that happens to prevent blood loss is that platelets capture to that site of damage. But due to the speed of the blood flow, it's very difficult for the platelets to attach by themselves. Um, so we have this protein called von Willebrand factor, and it's a big sticky ball of string. You damage your blood vessel, that big sticky ball of string can stick to that blood vessel. It can unwind, it can then capture platelets. And in that way, we can then start to actually limit blood loss. Um, now, the reason why we're interested in it is, apart from the fact it's a massive protein, it's a huge, huge protein, it's very interesting to work with. Um, we're very interested because um, there's, a, there's a clinical phenotype called von Willebrand's disease, and this, this is actually very, very common, and it's a bleeding phenotype. So people who lack VWF or have low levels or have a VWF protein that doesn't function properly, they have a bleeding phenotype. So we're very, we're, we're very interested in, in, in how this works. But on the other side, it's now becoming apparent that individuals who have very high levels of von Willebrand factor, or they have a VWF protein that can't be controlled, so it's almost like kind of um, um, hyper-functional um, in a way, 
these individuals are more likely to experience cardiovascular complications. So things like, you know, myocardial infarction, strokes, um, you know, DVTs and, and so on. And we're very interested in my lab in, in why that is, in, you know, what's the mechanism behind it, what, what turns a VWF molecule from being nice and safe and capturing platelets and stopping you from losing blood into something which can actually cause a very serious, um, you know, clinical complication and how we, we can target that as a uh, possible therapy. That's fantastic, Tom. I, I really wish you the best of luck. So what we'd like to get out of the podcast is that we'd like to see the humans behind the cutting edge scientists. So with that in mind, I wondered if I could start by asking you if you could tell us a bit about your life. Where did you grow up and where are you from? Okay, well, um, I can take you right back. So I, I, I was born in a place called Stratford in East London. Um, a lot of people will know that as where the 2012 Olympic Games were held. Um, when I grew up in Stratford, it wasn't as pretty as it is now. It was a fairly rough part, part of London. Um, and I actually grew up in, I think it's the second poorest borough in the um, whole of the UK. Um, went to a fairly good school. Wasn't bad, wasn't the best. Um, you know, childhood was okay. I did, I actually, at school, I actually had a very bad stutter. Um, so it did make school life quite tough. And I probably didn't achieve at school what I possibly could because I was quite kind of held back by that. Um, wasn't, was never really sure what I wanted to do. My, my dad worked in some kind of financial job that I've never really understood exactly what it was. I know it was something to do with trading shares, but it, but it was nothing like what you see now on kind of Wall Street and stuff. It was all kind of very old school. And yeah, I, I really had no idea what I kind of really wanted to do. I always really enjoyed science. I was always told at school that I was very bright, but maybe a little bit lazy. Um, wasn't bad at sport, was quite, quite, quite a keen runner. And I, as I sort of approached um, the kind of sixth form kind of kind of level, I, I sort of thought that I really wanted to go down some kind of science route. Unfortunately, when I started my L was my mum was diagnosed with with having liver cancer. Um, so obviously that was a big shock. I mean, I, I was was kind of sixteen at the time, um, you know, and, and never never really sort of thought that you know anything like that would ever happen. So that that did have quite quite a big impact. Um, so went went through A levels, totally failed. My A levels completely messed those up. Absolutely chaotic mess. Com- completely failed those. My mum sadly passed away when I was um, eighteen. Um, so I did an uh, next year of uh, sixth form, um, and it all kind of really went went on from there. So I managed to I sort of applied through UCAS to go to to sort of do a degree, and uh, I somehow managed to talk my way into doing a degree called paleobiology at the University of Portsmouth and not quite sure how I actually managed to to sort of do that but managed to get onto this course Um, and I can honestly say it was was the best thing that ever happened it was uh, I I, I started at at Portsmouth in 1998 Um, I met a group of guys and girls that are my best friends we're still in very close close contact and it's like a big cliche to say but they are my you know like family we're very 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 close and I literally wouldn't change that for the world I had a very wild year at uh, university, gained a bit of a reputation for the amount I could drink um, and how quickly I could down pints of beer and, and, and drink shots. Um, but unfortunately, that really wasn't the, the course for me. It wasn't what I really wanted to be kind of doing. So then I guess the obvious question would be, how come you chose to do paleobiology? You want the honest answer? <laughs> definitely, definitely. We always want the honest answer here at How to Make a Scientist. So basically, basically, a very good friend from sixth form who actually I, 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 I've not seen for many, many years. He was going to Portsmouth to study business and I literally had no idea what I wanted to do. And, you know, obviously with all the kind of like family stuff that was taking place, I hadn't even thought about this. And I mean, I, I should probably say as well that none of my brothers and sisters who uh, are much older than me had ever gone off to, you know, do any, um, uh, any kind of further studying. Um, in fact, I mean, the most that anyone had done in my family was my, my brother had started his A-levels and had left after, after the first year, right? So it, You're the first in your family. Yeah, so the, you know, like, sort of first one to go. And I and I'd, I'd never really thought about it. So, so going through sixth form, I think where, where a lot of my friends were sort of thinking about, you know, I, I had a friend who ended up, uh, I think he did medicine here. Um, 
and I had like another friend who wanted to do law at Birmingham I literally had no idea what I wanted to do and with all the family stuff that was going on I just wasn't you know really thinking about it and the whole paleo thing literally came up because my friend he um he was as I said going off to Portsmouth to do business he he, he had a place there and he said well look, why don't you just sort of come and do this just come and get get on a course and um I went through clearing I think it was a new course as well. I don't think many people wanted to actually do it. And that's probably why I got the chance to actually do it. And um, and like I said, it sort of turned into this year of just like hardcore kind of partying. I mean, it was just absolutely ridiculous, but a lot of fun, a hell of a lot of fun. Um, but towards the end of the year, obviously, um, I hadn't done very well in terms of the academic side of it. This kind of culminated actually with a chemistry exam, which I hadn't revised for. I turned up, was feeling very sick from the night beforehand. And um, one of my friends said to me before the exam, he went, I dare you to eat the exam paper. And I did just that. So that, yeah, you know, that was the sort of thing that kind of went down. Um, but again, towards the end of the year, I mean, the kind of course leader said, look, there's no way that um, you're gonna pass this you know, you're not going into the second year. Sounds fair enough if you, you know, if you eat the exam. <laughs> it is a fair point. It is a fair point. There's not many students that pass after, after reading their exam papers. Um, and it just basically, I, I just sort of like, then I thought, look, I really have to do something. I really have to kind of like turn this around. And I was considering leaving university. Um, I was working for Labbrooks, the betting shop at the time. It was, it was just like a part-time job and they had heard of me a job as a manager and I thought, look, I really don't want to do this. And But what I had found was that doing paleo, apart from having all this fun and partying, the kind of like, the more, uh, I guess, like sort of scientific part of it. So we had lectures on enzymes and that sort of thing. That was really beginning to kind of resonate. And I thought, like, actually, I really would like to do something like, like this. So as I was coming up to the end of the year, I reapplied through uh, UCAS and um, Portsmouth had become like my second home, really wanted to stay there, had this wonderful group of friends. Most of all, I, I will say actually, I think out of the group of us that started paleo, only two people actually finished it. Everyone else went off to do different courses. Um, and I went through clearing again and there, there, there was a biomedical science course. It was a very good biomedical science course. And I thought, I'm just going to try and get onto this. Um, and one of the lecturers, who I really can't remember his name. I should look it up. I think it was a guy called John Cook. Um, I had a really lovely chat with him and he said, well, look, I can't let you go into the proper first year. And he went because you, you just, just don't cut it. But he said, what I will do is we'll offer you a place on the like year zero year, essentially. And like a foundation year. Yeah, basically. And that's when everything suddenly clicked into place. So I sort of essentially got to reset kind of A-levels, if you like. I, I, I kind of did this like year zero course. And I really, that's when I sort of really started to excel. And I actually realised, look, I'm, I'm actually fairly intelligent. And it was, you know, I kind of sort of went from being this kind of drunken fool, essentially, to sort of being the guy that everyone was coming to ask for, for advice on a, you know, um, I know chemistry questions and everything else. So that's really interesting that you've experienced both sides of the spectrum there, because obviously you're very uh, successful as you are now. So I suppose for some people, I think it's a matter of just getting it out of your system. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you, you feel, you know, that uh, I mean, and especially, you know, for you, I'm really sorry to hear about your um, about your mum and, and, and her cancer. I, I honestly had no idea. Um, so, yeah, I can imagine that, you know, sort of letting off a little bit of steam in your first couple of years. That must have must have felt good. It must have felt yeah. good. Yeah, definitely. It, you know, uh, certainly did. And as I said, the making friends that I'm now friends with, you know, for life, I wouldn't go back and change anything. I wouldn't, you know, sometimes sort of people say, well, would you have wanted to have like studied harder or, you know, would you have wanted just, just to have gone straight into your degree? And I think, well, yeah, OK, maybe I, you know, should have done. But actually, I've got friends that I'm now incredibly close with that, they're, you know, it's, it's almost like having a second family. And when things have been tough, which, you know, all of us go through tough, tough times in life. I've got a really good group of guys to sort of say, look, you, you know, things are pretty crap at the moment. Can you help out? Um, and I wouldn't have had that. I, you know, OK, I may have gone and done biomedical science to start off with and made the same friends, but you don't know that. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of looking back. I'm happy that I, I had that experience. Yeah. And then so I sort of finished the foundation year, passed that with Flying Colours, got onto the biomedical science course, um, start, started that. And again, I sort of went through, the, I, when, when I started the course, it was a case of, right, I'm just going to get this degree. Like my dad was like really, really proud. And he was like, look, you know, this is going really, really well now. Um, and then I just sort of started studying really, really, really hard. And I sort of found that a lot of the stuff was, was coming really, really easily. 
Um, I just really enjoyed the course. I, be, I became the course rep. There was um, a biomedical science society, which I was like sort of vice president of, became president in my final year. And then actually, as, as I sort of sat my first year exams, again, I was still partying hard. I won't say that the partying stopped. Um, I was that annoying student who would go out, everyone knew, would sort of spend Wednesday night after sports day getting completely paralytic. But I would turn up for lectures on a kind of Thursday morning. My coursework would always get top marks. And yeah, it was good. Really, really, really enjoyed it. You know, really had good fun. And my marks were good. And then it was really sort of like the, I think, the, the first semester of the, the second year where we had our exams and they, they came back and I sort of realised I, I was actually on for a first. And I was like, whoa, you know, this could actually really happen now. And then I sort of told my dad and he was obviously really proud. You know, it was like a really, really proud thing. But he, he was never, never too pushy. He was always like, look, come on, son, just really work hard, really try your best. Um, and he actually, I mean, he gave me a really good piece of advice, which I think is, which stands now, was he said to me at the time that um, your, your whole life isn't, isn't a sprint, it's a long marathon. And there's times during that race where you might need to run fast to catch up with people. But there's times during that race where you need to like sort of hold back. And he said, this is this is one of those times where don't go too fast. Don't burn yourself out, but just go nice and steady. And I sort of took, took that on board and, you know, worked really hard. And I finished top of my year. I was the only person in the year to get a first. Uh, I was awarded, it was the uh, the Institute of Biomedical Sciences Prize for Outstanding Achievement on a accredited biomedical science course. And it was just really cool. It was, it was just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Um, yeah. Oh, fantastic. It sounds very well, uh, we're very well deserved. Really, really, really well done. I, th- I suppose there's a really important message there as well, because I, I guess a lot of people kind of think that you, you, you have to have really excelled at your A-levels and you have to have attended, with no disrespect to Portsmouth of course, but you have to have attended one of the elite universities in order to be able to, to go on and be successful in something like academia or even industry or, or, or beyond. So the fact that you were able to show through through pure hard work that you were, you were, you were an excellent student is a, is a great credit to you, really, like, that's, that's well, awesome. Thanks, Alex. So for this next part, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about what you wanted to do after you graduated. So you've told us about how you got your first class degree and your uh, your awesome award. So could you please tell us how did you decide on what you wanted to do next? Okay, so I had applied to uh, medical school. I had, I, had, I had a place on a uh, four year graduate medical program. Um, but I have to admit, it wasn't I guess the the application to medical school was a bit of a I thought it was just the right thing to do and I thought you know like this sounds really really cool and it it was actually again like this sounds sort of like um, you know fairly cliched but um, I went traveling with some friends to Thailand and it was actually on a beach in Thailand so this this does sound so cliched but it was literally just a moment of look actually I don't really want to do clinical medicine I, d- I don't think that I would be be very good at it um I didn't really want to go and see patients and I just thought, look, I could do it. I'd end up a lot more in debt and in all honesty, I wouldn't be that good. You know, I know that, that this isn't for me. And that's when I thought, look, I really, I'm really enjoying the science. I loved all the practical classes and I thought, look, I, you know, yeah, that research is something that I really absolutely definitely want to do. So I spoke to the careers advisors at Portsmouth and they said, well, look, you know, if you can get a first, you can go straight into a PhD. Um, so I mean, this this was now this is what two, I graduated in two thousand and three. So you you could actually still go go kind of straight into a PhD then, um, and they were advising different PhD programs to apply for. So I I got my degree. I was looking around, started applying. I I applied to a few places. Um, I mean, off the top of my head, I can remember there was a PhD that I really wanted. It was uh, I was it was at the Royal London Hospital. I think I think it was part of Queen Mary in Westfield, and I got shortlisted for that. Came really close, but never got it. There was a PhD at Imperial which was doing gene therapy for thyroid cancer, and I almost got that but because I uh, couldn't speak French. I got picked by someone else. Um, there was a PhD at Oxford that I was offered, but I didn't get on with the supervisor. I, we would have clashed. We, we would have had a real clash, which again is another piece of advice that can maybe come later is to think about who um, your supervisor is. And there'd been this there been this PhD on jobs.ac.uk, which was here at um, Imperial, and it was looking at Ron Rillebrand factor, and it was specifically looking at um, how glycans affect VWF uh, structure and function. 
And I'll be honest, I saw it every day, right, looking online. And I was like, yeah, it, it, this does not sound sexy, right? This sounds like anti-sexy. And there's like, there's no way that I'll, I'll do that. And then it was getting towards, so this had been, so I sort of graduated or got my degree in the June. It was getting towards the October sort of time. And I hadn't found a PhD and I was working uh, at Portsmouth as a research te technician. And but I sort of had to make a decision whether to stay in Pompey for another year or come back to London. Because obviously, like, you know, having a house and, you know, rent and everything else. So I w was was going to stay, which probably would have been a, another year of partying. Um, and then I just thought, look, I've seen this PhD so many times. Maybe it's just fate. Or maybe it's just there, but come on, you know, just, you know, uh, uh, just apply for it. Um, and there was a bit of a case of, um, you know, Imperial College being very, very high, high up the kind of rankings. And I thought, oh, look, you know, I'll kind of never get one here. Applied for it, went for the interview and I had a phone call the afternoon, uh, some afternoon saying, you know, Tom, congratulations, the, the PhD yours. And I was like, oh, OK, wow, wow, wow. Um, and within about a week was back in London um, and kind of started my PhD with an Imperial. Ah, okay, fair enough. I think a lot of PhDs are found online. Not many people tend to specifically go looking for their PhD area. And maybe they just see something on jobs at .ac uk that they think, yeah, I can do that. So did you ever consider any other career path other than academic science? No, I mean, I, I as I said, as I was coming towards the end of my degree, it was I, either clinical medicine or or um, this, a PhD. And it was the kind of PhD that just simply won out. And I hadn't really considered anything else. It was just always write a PhD. Um, so it was just straight in. So you're always going to be a doctor either way. Oh, basically, right? basically. I mean, you know, like, so just to change your name on that credit card is, is something. You know? <laughs> I can't wait until I get to do that. Soon, soon, soon. Now, what advice would you give to a young person? So you've been through the uh, the track. What advice mm. would you give to someone who's either about to enter an undergraduate or mm. about to uh, enter a PhD program? Who's looking for a P PhD program? And um, what advice would you would you give to these people uh, that you think would help them to make a good decision? Okay, I think in terms of um, applying for a PhD, um, the first thing that I'll say is is don't always go for the sexiest sounding projects. I mean, that's based on kind of my, you know, what's happened to me. I think sometimes you can have projects that are sold as being like amazing. And actually when you really get it, get it down to it, the nitty gritty isn't there. So that would be my sort of first piece of advice is to really find out what that kind of PhD is all about. I think also be be flexible as well that, you know, you may want to go, go, go for a PhD to, I don't know, cure cancer, but be realistic about what's going to happen during your, you know, PhD that you, you're part of a big, you know, like massive jigsaw puzzle. And you're, you know, if you see research as a massive puzzle, your PhD is going to be a very tiny piece of that puzzle. Now, obviously, you can't complete a jigsaw without every single piece, so you need that little piece. But do keep that in mind that you know you're not suddenly going to go into a research lab and within three years you're going to find a new drug to treat cardiovascular disease or to treat cancer or cure AIDS. So you know, just 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 have a kind of realistic um, thought about as to what a, a a kind of PhD really is. I think the other piece of advice that I would say is I think do, you know, if you can look around everywhere, you know, don't be afraid to look at other institutions. I mean, um, so part of my job is that I, um, I, I co-run a master's course and I probably have this conversation at least 10 times a year with students who are applying for PhDs. And it's all about Imperial College. It's all about Oxford. It's all about Cambridge. And you know what? They're wonderful places. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Imperial is a wonderful place to work. Right? Oxford, I'm sure, is a wonderful place to work. Obviously, not as good as Imperial College, but it's still pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, <laughs> big up Imperial. But um, there are there's a lot of places out there that uh, you know what? They're just as good. They're, they're wonderful places to visit. They're wonderful places to live. And they can offer you just as good PhD. You know, I mean, so there's, you know, there's just, just a whole plethora of, of kind of projects out there. And if you can be a bit more flexible about what you choose to study and about where you choose to live, you might find that there's more doors that, that, that are kind of open to you. You know, so I know that, if, you know, for some students, they have to stay in London for like, personal reasons or there's reasons that, why they want to stay there. But if you can be flexible, there is more stuff open to you. I think the other thing that I would say as well is make sure that 
you know, try. It's obviously difficult from an interview and, and stuff like that, but make sure that you gel with the person who's going to be supervising you for three years because. You know, there's always there's always some kind of PhD supervisor breakdown. It just invariably happens. It, there's going to come a point when the two of you are going to have a rock about something. Um, but if you can get on very well with your supervisor, it does make life a lot easier. And I think the other thing as well is think about what kind of lab you want to go into. Um, you know, again, this is something else we say to the MSc students is, you know, you can go into a really big established lab. You know, you can you know try and get a PhD in one of the really big bad boy bad girl labs but you know and that may suit someone that's really really good but you know you may just become another phd student you know you're just another cog that's going through that that lab you know you're going to go in you may not get that much attention you'll get your project your phd you've got that lab on your cv and that may suit some people for other people have a thing you know you may want to go with someone younger you know you may choose to go with someone who is just starting out their their group because you know what they need you to pass you know they re, you know if if you fail your phd it's bad news for them so that mm. they're going to be paying you a lot of attention and that's where you might find there might be scope for more of a future career because you're not just another PhD student going into a lab that's going to churn out their paper churn out their thesis and then be moved on you know you could go into a younger lab with someone who isn't as well um, established, that their name isn't as big, but actually they're going to want to get you your PhD, they're going to get you through, and they may want you to actually stay on afterwards. And then you can start to carve out your own kind of research and um, your own niche. And I guess that leads on to my final piece of advice is, you know, f just try and find a niche area. Um, you know, try and find something which you become the go-to person at. And that may take you three years, it may take you five years, it may take you kind of 10 years. But if you want a career in, in research, that's, in my opinion, the best thing to do is to find that niche area that you become that kind of go-to person that everyone wants to talk about, about that specific thing. Definitely, yeah. So I, I agree with all of that. That's fantastic advice. Thank you so much. Um, I suppose, uh, so this podcast is aimed at all different um, stages of people's yep. lives and careers. So, yep. um so for somebody like me, and there's many PhD students now up and down the country, uh, what uh, and also specifically within this pandemic time, mm. um, what advice would you give to uh, second or final year PhD students who mm. are thinking about um, what what their next steps would be? So yep. also, if you, if you could potentially relate that to uh, to your own experiences, so mm. what you did uh, for for your PhD, or mm -hmm. um, d did you consider moving abroad? Um, what, yeah, what would your advice okay. be? Okay, well, I mean, when I started my um, post here, I mean, I kind of, as I sort of went from being this, like, first-class student at uh, Portsmouth, sort of a sudden, I came into e e this lab and I knew nothing, right? I suddenly realised that actually, oh, my gosh, I'm way out of my depth. I think that's a familiar, that's probably a familiar feeling for many people, this idea of uh, imposter syndrome, like, yeah. what on earth am I doing here? I don't deserve to be here. Um, yeah. yeah quite quite literally i mean i remember my first um, um ever lab meeting and uh, a guy that was doing his phd at the same time jonathan he sort of walked in with this beautiful western blot gel and it was like new data that ended up being be, being published and i was looking at still thinking i don't know what that means like, what's this <laughs> like, I, I, I don't get it and you know that's sort of everyone's talking about protein c and protein s and tfpi and i'm just thinking i really don't understand i, I, I just don't get this um but i mean but but eventually stuff sort of began to 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 click you know like i mean my sort of phd was followed a kind of typical trend and nothing working for the first 18 months it was just like like this is just ridiculous and then stuff kind of really began to to to, to kind, of, kind of click into place um and then i was so i was lucky enough to be mentored by a really fantastic mentor so mike mike lafan was uh, essentially my supervisor and i had another guy james um o'donnell and james actually left to go to dublin to head up the hemophilia center out in dublin so he left um, halfway through um, but he stayed in very good contact and everything else. So I had two very amazing mentors. And as I was coming towards the end of my PhD, um, the, it, it just seemed logical to, to, to do a postdoc. Um, it just seemed to me the most logical thing to do. I was really enjoying research. The research started to go quite well. I had published a nice paper. Um, you know, I thought, look, I'm, I am really enjoying this and this is really what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is the job that I want. Um, so we wrote a BHF project grant, which got funded. Um, we were sort of quite, quite, quite lucky that that, that, that got funded. And then after my, so I'm just thinking now, so after the BHF project grant, I was lucky enough to be awarded um, a BHF Intermediate Basic Science Fellowship. 
Um, so I was sort of like one of the kind of lucky ones that got the uh, uh, fellowship route. So I think my first piece of advice with that would be, I think if you're coming towards the end of your PhD, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait for something to happen. I would try and make it happen yourself. I think there's no point waiting around. I think if you want to stay on in your lab, go and talk to your supervisor and talk about writing a grant. And it's not something which you can leave until the last minute. You can't hand in your thesis and have a week's worth of funding left and say, hey, I really want to stay because it, it is a long drawn out process of kind of getting a grant ready and sending it off. But I think if if you're proactive about it, um, then that's really good. And, you know, you're you're making it known that you want to stay there and you're making it known that you really want to sort of be a postdoc and you really want to kind of, kind of do this. You know, get involved in the grant writing process. Try and have your own ideas. Um, and but again, don't don't leave it too late. And but I would also say at the same time, do do kind of look around. You know, do like sort of always keep keep an eye out for what is around because again, you know, the same with a PhD post. There's lots of postdocs out there as well. So you know, it is really really good to kind of keep um, your eyes open. Um, I think in the current, I mean, I will be honest, I think with the current pandemic, it, I would hate to be a PhD student coming to the end. I think it'd be really, 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 really tough. And I'm, I mean, I sort of really feel for kind of anyone who's actually doing a PhD at the moment, anyone applying for a PhD and anyone who is coming to that point where they're going to have to, their, their funding's finishing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would just, you know, again, just sort of try to have faith in your own work. Um, you know, talk to your supervisors, try and just get whatever post you can be because it is very, 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 um, you know, kind of tough at the moment. If you can get that that postdoc, and I think, I mean, personally speaking, I do think there are a lack of good postdocs. I, I think there are a lack of good postdocs around. Um, it is very competitive for the kind of PhD market, and it is also competitive for the postdoc market, but I, I think... Um, you know, a lot of people finish their PhDs and not quite sure what they want to do. They en they end up in a postdoc and they suddenly realise that a postdoc isn't for them or that, that 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 kind of research career isn't really for them. So what makes a good postdoc mm. or what makes a good postdoc opportunity? I think what makes a good postdoc opportunity is you if you're staying in the same lab, I think that's a good thing. Um, I mean, different people would give different advice on this. I'm sure that during the course of these kind of podcasts, you know, someone's going to say you need to move away from your lab I've always remained in the same lab and I don't think that it's um, held me back there are definitely advantages to moving away there's definitely advantages to going to work abroad for example to going to see how how things work in different countries moving labs within the same country you get to see how things run in a um, you know like sort of different way you know just just by going to a different in, in, in institution you can appreciate things maybe a, a bit better um, I mean, one piece of advice that someone, or well, not really a piece of advice, but something that someone said to me once was that he he went from doing a PhD at Oxford in a very rich lab, to I think he went to do he he did his first postdoc. Um, uh, it might have been at the University of Westminster, but like it, it was one of the sort of like kind of you know London universities that's quite low down the food chain, and he said that it was quite an eye opener because he went from a very rich, wealthy environment to actually where to to an environment where he had to learn to kind of budget very well. But then when he went on to his next postdoc, he felt that made him a much better scientist because he wasn't just chucking money at a problem. He had to really think about every penny that he was actually spending. But I think what, so what makes a good postdoc um, opportunity? Learning new skills, you know, it's so like learning something a bit different from your PhD. So if there's any techniques which you haven't really done during your PhD, you know, if you find a postdoc which offers you the chance to learn some new skills, you know, so you can kind of pick up a, a, a different skill set. It's it's a good time to, to switch fields as well. I mean, you know, bear in mind, your PhD, you don't have to do a PhD in the field that you want to actually be in. Uh, again, we say this to the master's students about their six-month project. You don't have to do a six-month project in that field that you want to kind of work in. It's about being trained up as a scientist. Same, same as a PhD, you know, you don't necessarily have to do a PhD in, in you know, cancer if you want to sorry uh, you don't necessarily have to do a phd in kind of cancer if you want to end up working in cancer it's it's about the skill set and those techniques that you learn learning to think like a scientist learning to plan stuff out um you know um, as a scientist i think what makes a good postdoc is i think someone who's willing to really get involved um someone who's really re willing to take ownership of the project that's in front of them um, you know, someone who's sort of really willing to go that extra mile, you know, so if you really want a career in academic research, I think it's not just a case of turning up to work and doing your assays and, and going home. If you really want to go far, you really need to try to immerse yourself in it, constantly reading around the subject, thinking of new ideas, 
um, you know, going and talking to your supervisor and saying, look, you know, this is what we're working on, but I've had this idea to do this. I'm trying to read ahead, you know, that sort of thing. I, I think that's what, what makes a really good postdoc. That, that sort of answered my, my follow up to, um, you know, if you've had a bad PhD mm. experience, then what would you what would you want to mm. do afterwards? And I suppose, yeah, that would be the time if you wanted to switch yeah. fields or, and, and learn a new skill set. Yeah. That's that's the absolute perfect yeah. opportunity because sometimes, yeah, like a lot of people find out that they, they really don't enjoy their PhD mm-hmm. or they get midway through and they um, they realize that the thing that they that they were uh, working so hard towards that they really liked is just yeah. not what, um, you know, makes them. Uh, excited about yep. research. Yep. So thank you so much for sharing so far your, your journey uh, up to up until this point. But what I'd like to do is discuss some of the experiences that you've actually had within science. And I'd like to start by asking you what has been your most memorable experience in science. Oh, my most memorable experience. I, to be honest with you, it's it's it's. I would say it's actually probably getting my my PhD. I think I'll never forget yeah. the day that I got my, um, you know, that I did my viva and was awarded it. Um, I think I mean that was it was just fantastic. It was, you know, like sort of most PhD students going into the viva, I was incredibly nervous, um, and then it ended up being this wonderful like kind of four hour, um, hour, hour chat about the work that I had done. And I mean, for me personally, it was it was it was just a fantastic experience. I I just really 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 enjoyed it. I think. Another thing to say, which was memorable, which which it doesn't sound like much, and it's it's not a big kind of like breakthrough moment, but when I, like I said, when I began my PhD, I really did struggle. You know, I sort of gone as I said, I'd gone from being this first class student to being a kind of another idiot in a lab who had no idea what was going on. And when it all started to click, I was uh, I was I was doing a method called VWF Multimer gels, and when I started, the method wasn't established. We were running a really cumbersome gel system. And I spent months and months and months trying to work out a way to make it work. And I just came up with this quite simplistic way of running these gels. Now, it doesn't sound like much. Like I said, it, it's not a Nobel Prize winning piece of science. But I think for me, that was the first time that I thought, actually, I can really do this. That I can take a scientific problem and I can go away and I, and I can work out how to make that work. And yeah, so that, that, that was the first time in science I thought, wow, I can actually really, 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 really do this. Uh, and that's kind of like always stuck with me. So whenever anything else is, is kind of failing, I always think back to that moment. You mentioned about your dad giving you some excellent advice, but um, who in science, or maybe maybe let's not name names, but um, uh, what's been the best piece of scientific advice that somebody ever gave to you? Is to be patient. Very, very simply, <laughs> just be patient. <laughs> and it's, I yeah. mean, that, that is probably, that's probably the best thing is to literally, is to just be be patient it's so much easier than it sounds isn't it be patient like oh it'll work if you try it in all these yep. different ways but you know i suppose it's i suppose it's also um the culture of instant gratification yep. um i don't know how how much that weighs into um my generation but patience is it's one of those things that you you want results now you're getting pressured to get results so learning it is it's very <laughs> tough it's it's it very is. very tough it, 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 it is very very tough but i think you need to be patient so you know i mean like the best piece of advice that i have ever had is to be patient the other thing is actually from the same person again i won't name names is to be resilient um accept the fact that you know you you're choosing this job where at different parts of it people are going to tell you stuff is rubbish now, whether they're telling you your papers or your grants are rubbish because they think they're rubbish, whether they're telling you they're rubbish because they're doing some, something similar, whether it's because they don't like you, you just don't know. But you are going to have to accept that, you know, not every paper you send off for review is going to get accepted. Not every grant is going to get um, accepted. You know, not even every essay that you run will will work. So I think you need to you need to be, be patient and try to be as um, resilient as you possibly can. Um, another very good piece of advice though which I got um, was to always be open-minded and to always listen to absolutely everyone and to always just take on everyone's opinions that it doesn't matter what stage you ever get to if it's an MSc student who's you know you know saying something their opinion is just as valid as a senior prof you know or always take on board whatever everyone is saying definitely you've got you know you're, you're the sponge right you have to you have to soak up all that knowledge and you really really need to uh, absorb as much as Absolutely. you can 
but like a sponge I suppose there is going to be a saturation point and you are gonna not be able to absorb any more so I suppose the filtering aspect is also uh, something yep, that you'd, you'd have to do you know information yep. overload and yep. overwork is also yep. a big thing but that kind of leads me into uh, my next question which would be you know your your top life and work your work life balance like what what would your your top advice be this is something that i've um you know i'm really excited to hear about because i it's something i struggle with myself you know like like you mentioned before you really have to be like trying really hard to make sure that you're you know uh ahead of your peers but that does come at a, a, a little bit of a cost so how can you work around this yeah, I mean that is a really, really, really good point because it is it is difficult. It is it is very, very tough. And I think it's the same it's the same for any any kind of like career pathway, regardless of whether it's science, law, business. I think, you know, if you do really want to get to the top, you do have to put those those, those hours in. Um, that's the kind of down downside to it. I I guess that you know one could say that if you're not prepared to put the work in, it's maybe not the job for you. I think. And, and again, I mean, this actually comes back to advice that my dad gave me was he 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 once said to me that you can sleep when you're dead. Right. And and his advice always was was to was to uh, work hard, but also play hard and all, but always make sure. And the most important thing was always make sure that you've got time at home. And that's the key thing. And I think, I, I mean, having had kids and uh, again, I mean, like this is something that my dad said to me as well. You know, he's obviously like a big kind of focal point in my life um, was one thing that he did say to me was that when my my children were born, he said, look, you're going to have sleepless nights. You're going to, ha- you know, you're going to go for weeks where you're completely shattered and wandering around like a complete zombie. You're going to go to work. You're going to feel sick at work because you're so tired. And he said, but it will pass. And he went one day they'll start sleeping through the nights and you'll miss it and you'll wish that you were back at three o'clock in the morning holding a baby right and I was like yeah yeah whatever but it is, it is really true it is so 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 true and uh, so I think you need to you, you do need to balance things out um and you need to make time to have something away from work because if 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 it is just constantly work 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 you will eventually just just break down so I think you know you need to make sure that you're working hard you need to make sure that you're playing hard you have to have that release I mean I know it's difficult during lockdown we can't go to bars and clubs or you know like gyms or anything like that but whatever your kind of release is you need to do it you you need to make that time you need to make time to see your family make time to see your friends and I think also never be afraid to take a step back that there's going to be periods where you know you're going to have those months where everything's happening you know so everything's taking place you need to get I mean like right now I'm sort of like trying to struggle with running um well we've got the master's course i've got a teaching week next week followed by a two-week research practical um i've got samples that are due for study uh, somewhere else that need to be done i've got a podcast to do but <laughs> yeah and we, we, you know we've, we're so appreciative no, no, but, they, they, but you know you have these really um, in, um, intensive periods but you then need to make sure that you also have that period where you can slow down and don't, you know really just don't 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 be afraid to take that kind of time for yourself and your family because otherwise you will just burn out totally totally i uh yeah totally agree uh, i don't have kids yet but i can imagine that that uh yeah uh, i'd hate it at first waking up at night but then you know yeah you, you'll eventually you, you eventually miss some uh some aspects so i i now wanted to ask so far, I mean, you're still a young researcher by all means. You're still very young. Thank still you. Very, very young. Very young. Very young. <laughs> very young. Very Sorry. Young. Um, but what so far has been has been the highlight? Um, I think okay. Um, as I said, getting the uh, uh, PhD itself was a massive highlight. Getting the BHF fellowship was was a big thing. That that was really really cool. I mean, again, I sort of applied for that, and you know, I I, I would have been devastated if they had said no. I actually played it very cool. And was like, oh, I don't mind. I've got backup plans, everything else. <laughs> But I mean, I would have been in distraught if 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 that hadn't come off. But I th- I think getting that was like so far my my kind of biggest thing. Um, also, when I got the academic position here as well, I think I mean because I worked really hard to kind of get to 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 this level, and it is a it is a scary thing for any researcher. I think because the career path is so paved with. <laughs> not knowing what's happening and we don't have this sort of like clear kind kind of pathway through i think be being able to get a senior lectureship was was a really massive thing um because it, it, it kind of shows that where you know the people that have given you that senior lectureship obviously have some faith in you and that they feel that you can do the job and that makes you feel good yeah 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. Then, <laughs> the hardest decision of your career. What what has happened? Have you ever been tempted to to move into industry? Have you ever been tempted to move to a different institution? Has has there been? I mean, you don't have to go into specifics, of course. But has there ever been any uh, like intense pressure on you in terms of your career? Uh, what's what's been uh, the hardest? Oh, the hard, gosh, the hardest. Yep. Um, you may know about this actually. So the hardest bit was um, back in. I've, I've lost track of the years now. Um, <laughs> maybe that is a sign that I'm um, actually aging. I think it was. It was around. It was around about 2018. Um, I was so my fellowship was coming to an end, and also I think my fellowship had actually ended or was about to finish, and was obviously thinking about the next step and what would was going to happen afterwards and there was talk about applying for a BHF senior fellowship but they're very difficult like really 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 tough to to get um obviously having a family as well you're sort of slightly worried about your job not being 100 uh, percent safe and there was a um a senior lectureship um came up at the Royal Veterinary College in London and I sort of saw it on one of the kind of job advert sites and I thought oh you know vet college I'm 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 no vet, um, so sort of like tentatively sent an email, and the sort of the like sort of head of um, department there got back, and she invited me just to come for an informal chat. So went over to the RVC, and you know it turns out that they do some beautiful research, wonderful research, um, and it's not just about animals that they they've got a very good kind of human based research group as well. So I toyed with it, applied for this senior lectureship, and I thought, okay, if I get it, I'm, I know that I'm going to go mad deciding what to do, but let's just apply for it anyway. So I applied for it, was interviewed, and got the position. <laughs> and um, yeah, I probably had about three months where I literally had no idea what to do. And I, I, it was incredibly stressful. Um, it sounds a bit weird to say that having a job offer is stressful, but it was, it was horrendous. So I literally <laughs> did not know what to do. I think most of my friends got bored of hearing about the RVC because it was the same chat every single day. It was like, you know, um, hi, Matt. So I've been off this post at the RVC. Imperial have said that they want to keep me. It's not quite a senior lectureship. The RVC post is a senior lectureship. What shall I do? He's like, well, look, you know, here's here's my advice. Then I find up my next friends, you know, like, hi, Gordy. I've been off at this post. And it was just the same thing day in, day out. And I literally had no idea what to do. Um, and in fact, I actually I accepted the job at the RVC. I then I then went back and rejected it. <laughs> I then accepted it. I then accepted it again. Then went back and rejected it. And I'm not proud to say that I actually I think I accepted and turned it down three times. Um, like uh, yeah, so it wasn't my kind of finest hour. Um, so yeah, that was that was very difficult. It, it it was very hard to walk away from Imperial College. It was like very 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 difficult. Um, and I guess it worked out because I mean I'm sort of very happy where I I am now and. Then the kind of senior lectureship post came up here, which I got. So I think it it did work out well. But I mean, I do kind of consider that the RBC is almost like a kind of second home <laughs> in many ways. Why don't we move on to the the next uh, section? So the next section, I wanted to talk a bit more about your your passions outside of science. So all of those um, you know personal stories that you've just given are, are you know, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm sure that the listeners are, are they're really appreciative of, of 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 all of that advice. But now I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you like to do outside of science. So so what do you do in your leisure time? Uh, okay, well the leisure time is often taken up with the kids. Um, so. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I could say what leisure time, um, but no, I mean, like, I, I, li- I like spending time with my children. How old are um, they? So Arabella is nine and Jamie's five. Um, so they're really, really, really good, good fun. Um, I like seeing my, my friends as well. I mean, obviously during lockdown, it's, it's, it's been a nightmare, you know, like, you know, I mean, I guess it's just the, the same for everyone. Um, but I, I, I really enjoy walking. I'm a keen runner. Uh, although I've not run properly for a long, long time now. I used to run seriously, but I think university and everything else kind of put put paid to that. I, I did start running again when I started my uh, PhD. But again, just the kind of PhD lifestyle didn't really <laughs> fit in <laughs> with running. Um, but I'm a, a very keen, keen walker and I love nature. Um, so I sort of love being, being um, outdoors. I love being by rivers and lakes and enjoy fishing. 
and also brew brew beer as well. So I've sort of uh, yeah. Well, during lockdown, I've I've always wanted to, to brew beer. Always wanted to brew beer. Um, I mean, you probably guess from some of my stories that I'm a, a keen drinker as well. Um, but I'm a a a big fan of real ale. And um, during lockdown, I just said, look, I've got the time to actually brew brew some beer. So I sort of brewed my first batch of beer during lockdown, which was pretty good actually. Pretty good for you. Was it a was it a bathtub job? No, it wasn't a bathtub job. I sort of bought all the kit, you know, and sort of had all my barrels and tubings and God knows what else. And, and I, I made this Irish stout, which which went down pretty well. So I, I did a second batch for Christmas, um, which was good, which my dad tasted. So again, to come back to my dad, the biggest seal of approval. And in fact, forget about any BHF fellowship. Okay? <laughs> the, the biggest thing was my dad having a pint of my Irish stout and saying, you know what, son, you could sell that in a pub. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. You're going to have to give me some of this Irish stuff. Send us, send us some over. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to. I'd really, really love to try. Really, really love to try. What are you a passionate advocate for? Um, yeah, I'm a passionate advocate for female rights. So I think women get a really tough time in all sorts of careers. Uh, you know, science is, is obviously one as well. And I think a lot's been done to improve that. But I think... <sighs> I, I mean, I, I had a period with my with my son where I did a lot of the actual childcare. I was doing all the nighttime feeds and everything else, and I really, I just don't know how how kind of mothers cope. I, I just, I mean, I was like sort of coming to work just a complete state because I'd been been up all night. Now I think women just handle that sort of stuff just so much better than men do, and. I just think, yeah, that it, it it really is tough, and I think it's it is quite sad that sort of even still, I mean, I mean, we're what you know, two thousand and twenty one, that we've had to have you know things like the sort of hashtag Me Too movement and that sort of stuff that, you know, that there's that in that that sometimes women's women are just not getting the same rights as men, and it's it's just absolutely not on. It's just not acceptable. And on on that note as well, I mean, I'm I'm a kind of like big advocate for um, um, obviously race equality and also gender equality as well. Um, again, I, I sort of think it's you know it's just absolutely horrendous that we're we're this kind of you know so called wonderful species that can do all these weird and wonderful things. We can CRISPR and clone and God knows what else, and yet people still take abuse because of their skin color or because of if they prefer men to females, it's it's just not appropriate. So I'm I'm quite vocal about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. I believe in in a meritocracy where uh, people should be given merit based upon their their ideas rather than you know um, their, who they are um, as a, you know like what 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 body they were born into. Um, it's, uh, it's it's a huge thing, and although you know there are, there is elements that are I suppose a little bit encouraging in that there is a little bit of change happening. Personally, I, I believe that the pace of change is uh, is far too slow. It is far too slow. I mean, I, I do agree. I do think things are beginning to change. I think, I mean, we, um, as, uh, as a prime example, so we, I'm not sure if, you know, like you or your listeners have seen Bridgerton on Netflix. I haven't, actually, um, no. You haven't. Right, Bridgerton is worth a shout out, okay? It's, it, it is worth watching. But Bridgerton was done as a colourblind, um, like, kind of period drama. So there was, uh, you know, characters that were white, characters that were Asian, characters that were black. And it's, it's, it's something that had never really been done before. So, you know, um, you, you know, they were trying to keep things historically accurate, uh, um, as it were. OK, but this was just done as a colourblind drama. Absolutely brilliant. Like, absolutely wonderful. And we were speaking about it at home and my daughter said, well, what does colourblind mean? So we were trying to explain what this whole concept of, of a, a, a kind of colourblind drama meant. And she she didn't get it. She's like, well, I don't really understand what the point is. And and, and what I think is is really encouraging about that is that there's a lot of children growing up now where colour isn't an issue and where, you know, like sort of, um, you know, someone's gender, someone's race, it's it just means absolutely nothing. And I think that that is really encouraging. And that's hopefully the way that the world will go go forward. And not to obviously make a statement about Donald Trump, but it's quite nice that he's he, he's out of power as well now. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to stay apolitical on this podcast, um, so I, 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 maybe I shan't. I did that one my... out. I did that one out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't express my own personal opinions on that one, but um, <laughs> but uh, I, I I do understand um, your position on that.
finally then I'd, I'd like to just maybe get your, your final thought how do you see the, f- the future of your field so you, you mentioned obviously about about VWF is, is your main focus so do you think new technologies that have emerged such as CRISPR in the last 10 years will, will they become so advanced that potentially the problem will be solved for, for VWF and you'll, you'll be out of a job oh good question uh, 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 that's a cutting question as well I know <laughs> um, so yeah no, how, I, what's the future of your field what do you, how do, how do you see it? yeah I think as I said at the start I think there's so much that we understand about how blood clots but there's so much that we don't un- understand that I think there's, there's plenty of research left to be done and there's more that we kind of find out every single year um, uh, about how various proteins in our kind of, kind of cascade work. So I think that, yeah, I mean, there's plenty more scope for different research. And I think, but I mean, again, this is probably another crucial thing for any young, young, younger researcher um, is that, you know, don't be afraid to sort of fan out, you know, don't sort of try and jump ship, you know, every five, five minutes, but don't be afraid to kind of adapt and to have your sort of research fanning out into to kind of, you know, like sort of new areas. And, and don't be afraid to explore those new areas. I think in terms of thrombosis and hemostasis, I think, you know, like I said at the start, there's plenty of scope for new therapies. The, the anti-thrombotic drugs that are on the market right now are fantastic, but like any drug, well, like some drugs, they, they can be improved on. Um, you know, from, your, from the sort of work that you're doing with the flow chambers and microfluidics, you know, it's, um, you know we've uh, obviously, obviously spoken about that many times there's a massive amount of scope. You know, there's a big scope to, to move a lot of stuff away from kind of animal models, which are not necessarily the best thing. And I think like a lot of the microfluidic work, especially in our field, is now becoming a really, really, really big thing. You know, we're, we're talking about a process that happens under blood flow. And yet a lot of the kind of assays that we do are in test tubes. So I think, you know, there's plenty more kind of, kind of years left in that yet. I hope so. Anyway, at worst, I am out of a job. I'll I'll just fall back on making Irish stout if uh, if it comes down to that. <laughs> totally, totally. So, irrespective of the actual field that you're in, mm-hmm. just in science in general, which emerging trend do you see that has the most potential? Ooh, I hadn't thought about that question, Alex. Um, ooh, ooh, whoa, 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 whoa! Being being caught off guard with this one. I sent you the notes. For I read them. Me. I read them, but I missed that one. Um, <laughs> I think, okay, I think immunotherapy for cancer is a really interesting field. I think that's really, 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 really interesting. And I like the way the medicine's becoming kind of more of a personalised thing. I think that that is a big thing. Um, and, I mean, there are some, there's some fantastic therapies coming through. I mean, we, we've, in fact, actually next week, we've got a patient who was on one of the gene therapy trials for haemophilia A. Who So he had haemophilia A, severe bleeding, um, all his, like, you know, kind of childhood. Um, I think it's about five or six years ago now, was given a virus containing the factor eight gene and is now fine. You know, he, he's, he's got factor eight levels, which are, I, I, well, which were last time we spoke clinically normal and he doesn't experience any massive bleeds anymore. You know, so there are, there's some massive breakthrough therapies taking place. And I'm sure that over the next 20 to kind of 30 years, we're going to see some wonderful therapies emerging. Um, you know, cancer survival rates are going up. Um, you know, less pe- people are dying of cardiovascular disease so i think there's some really exciting stuff which is coming through you know with all the massive sort of you know genome sequencing i mean i remember when i was at kind of portsmouth and finishing off my degree i, I think they had just finished the first human genome sequence and it cost an extortionate amount of money you know now rna seq is kind of available to many labs you know so i think te- technology has moved so fast but i i would if i had to be put on the spot I, I would say i think the most exciting one is immunotherapy for cancer very finally, uh, the mm-hmm. very last question I'd like to ask you, which is something okay. that I'm going to uh, make sure to ask all of the, uh, the guests mm-hmm. that appear on the podcast, yeah. is yeah. if you could do it all over again, mm-hmm. what would you keep the same and what would you change? Mm-hmm. What would I keep the same and what would I change? I would keep everything the same. The only thing I would change is that I would party even harder. <laughs> Perfect. Tom, thank you. Thanks, Alex. And that brings us to the end of the very first episode of How to Make a Scientist. I'd like to thank Tom, first and foremost, for being on here. But then I'd also like to thank you, the listener. We want to hear from you, so please engage with us on our social platforms, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or write us a nice review on the podcast platform that you downloaded this episode from. Tom gave us some incredible advice in today's podcast. I hope it can prove useful for you. Until next time. Thanks for listening.